Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Norbert Samon. Norbert, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thank you. I don't think many people know about the history of Meinl. Like me personally, I- I've, I've done so much research on all these different companies, and it's like, it's funny because I thought Meinl like came out in like the 80s or the 90s or something because I just didn't know. And and there's, you know, some of the other symbol companies are hundreds of years old and you just kind of assume that that uh, you don't know. So, but but it goes back to 1951, right? That's right. The company was founded in 1951, yes. That's great. Per usual on the show, why don't we just hop right in and, uh, and well, first off, what is your role with Meinl? Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll go back and uh, hear the whole story of Meinl. Mm-hmm. Yes, my role at Meinl is I am the International Artist Relations Manager and Event Manager. Cool. I deal with all our artists, international artists. I have a colleague who handles artist relations for USA and Canada. His name is Chris Brewer. He's working out of Meinl, Nashville. And I handle all the other artists from the other parts of the world. I also do all our events, Meinl Drum Fest, NAMM Show, Music Messe, PASIC, all the all those events is usually what I plan and organize. Oh, that's great. I've been with the company since 30 years, since 1990. Wow. Obviously, I've done other jobs at Meinl prior to what I do now. But what I do now, I have been doing for um, about 15, oh, more longer than that, 22 years. Hmm. I started in 1998 with Artist Relations, yes. Wow. You're a, you're a Meinl guy through and through. <laughs> 30 years, yeah. It's a long time. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, you know this, obviously, but but Meinl is, it's. It, I'm sure it's been like this for a while, but Meinl is huge right now. I mean, you guys, to me, are, you're the cool symbol brand. And I say that always on this show. I'm unbiased, and I try and hit, I love every brand, but it just seems like you guys have done a great job of um, like guys like Mike Johnston, who's been on the show, just, I mean, you have really got on the wave of the very clean um, kind of film yourself at home, but do a really high quality job. Um, and there's a lot, everyone uses different brands, but I see a lot of Meinl. You guys are out there. Thanks a lot. Yeah. We are working hard to reach the point where we are now. And um, I'm gl- I'm always glad to hear that obviously things have worked out for us in the way they work out now. And this is the perception people have of Meinl right now. Because, yeah, I mean, it's not that we really plan to be the cool new brand. It somehow <laughs> developed into that. Yeah. You know, most of the people here who are in in the in the in the top management positions, we're all drummers, musicians, and basically we just try to build what 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 we love to see for ourselves as drummers you know we look at it from a drummer's perspective whatever yeah. whatever we do whether it is r&d or a&r or marketing in general all our videos um we're drummers and we produce symbols and content for other drummers so that in a way makes it easy or easier for us sure um, to to get to that point where we are now. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys, and maybe we'll talk about it further on down the line, but you, you have a lot of brands like, um, like I know symbols aren't really the only thing, if not, they're not the biggest thing that you guys do. Like even, even down to the, what is it? Nino, um, percussion. I teach a five-year-old right now, uh, who's just a buddy, uh, a guy I do work for his, his grandson, and I was playing a shaker the other day with him because he's five and you got to keep him interested. And I look and it's like, oh, my God, this is Nino. And I, and I look around and there's it's it's just so much percussion that you guys. Um, there's a lot of categories under your there brand. is a lot of categories. Yes. And besides being a manufacturer, we are also a wholesaling company like we distribute a lot of brands in the drum industry and also in the guitar industry. Yeah, um, we we import from other countries like we are the Tama distributor we're the Ibanez distributor for Germany and other European countries so and then we have our own brands like you already mentioned the percussion minor percussion Nino percussion sonic energy which is like a therapeutical field of like 
singing bowls and gongs and tuning forks, mm. that world where we are in. Um, and then we have an own guitar brand, which is called Ortega Guitars. Cool. It's only acoustic guitars, but yeah. it's our own brand, and we are the brand holder and the manufacturer. And then, of course, there is the cymbal world, which is a pretty huge uh, part of of our portfolio. Yeah, yeah but I would imagine. it started with cymbals. Like the first thing we did in 1951 was cymbals. So Roland Meinl, when he founded the company in 1951, that was the first thing he was doing. Hmm. And now, how did Make he cymbals, learn? Yeah. Let's let's jump in. But how did so Roland Meinl? How did he, you don't, and and I've talked about this with other, like Paul Francis and other symbol guys of like, you don't just say, you know what? Okay. I'm done working at this uh, bakery. I'm going to go make symbols. Like what's give us his background. And then let's just, let's just Mm -hmm. hop right in. His background is a little different. He was born in 1929 in a small city called Silberbach, which is in Germany, but now it's a part of Czech Republic. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1929. So by the time World War II was over in 1945, he was 16 years old. Okay. So when he was 16 years, World War II was over. Um, he finished his school and he did a training as a music musical instrument maker. Like this is the education, the job that he actually learned. Wow. In this area where he grew up. After that. A lot of people after World War II, they got displaced to other parts in Germany. And so did Roland too. He got displaced to a small town very near where we are here now, near Würzburg. And so there he lived and there he did a job training as a salesman in a local company that had nothing to do with musical instruments. It was just a local company and he did a salesman training. He was always traveling back and forth between the area he originally came from, Silberbach, and where he was displaced to in near Würzburg. And he always, he brought like a accordion and then he brought back some potatoes. So hmm. after World War II, everything was really rough, yeah. you know, almost. And people had to just survive. They had to survive somehow. And that's... How he did how he did it he he traded with musical instruments and groceries and all kinds of stuff hmm. then he met his wife she was living here in the city of Neustadt Eich this was until a couple of years ago this is where we were based Neustadt an der Eich so he met his wife and they got married and simply out of because he he saw a demand for symbols with his trades and businesses he was doing, selling and buying musical instruments, he saw a demand for cymbals. Hey, cymbals would be nice to have. Yeah. So the first cymbals he traded were actually cymbals that he bought from somewhere, but those weren't professional cymbals at all. Those were like children's cymbals, toy cymbals. Sure. So he bought those and sold those. But those became more and more expensive and it got to a point where he said, okay, it's probably better if I start to, if I try to start to produce them by myself. And that's Mm. how he did it. It was all trial and error. His wife and he, he, they just went into the basement and they were cutting blanks (laughs) around, you know, they drilled the hole by hand. They started to press the symbol all by hand. And wow. that was very hard labor his wife and he had to do for like all, like we're now 52, 53. And until the end of the 50s, this is what they did. Hmm. Roland San Reinhold, he was born in 1952. So as a, as a children, as a baby, he, he grew into this environment of, hard labor and the parents producing symbols. This continued until the 50s were over, early 60s. But in the 50s already, he started to export symbols, mainly within Europe first, 
also to the USA already, but the main business was done domestically in Germany, but also within Europe. Hmm. So that's how it started. And Reinhold, his son, he grew into the company. And from there, it just became bigger and bigger. In the 60s, the wholesale idea of importing instruments from other manufacturers and selling them in Germany became more popular. So I'm not sure if you know the Hoshino company from Japan. Yes. Hoshino I, is yeah. Tama and Ibanez. Yeah. So in 1963, we became Hoshino's first international customer outside of Asia. And to this day, we are Tama and Ibanez distributor. We were mm. the first Tama Ibanez distributor outside of Asia in 1963. At that time also, in 1963, we uh, participated in the first Frankfurt Music Messe that kept running every year, every year, until a couple of years ago. But in yeah. 1963, we were already there exhibiting with our own products, symbols at that time, and also the instruments that we imported. Man, I, I think the... So I've done very early on, 50 episodes ago, I did something on the history of the the made in Japan, the stencil drums. And it's like the history and multiple episodes I've done kind of pieces together where there was one where um, uh, someone from Slingerland who his dad worked there, Jim Moritz, would say, oh, yeah, my dad invited people in from Japan and gave them pictures. And they they took pictures of the Slingerland factory and went back and then were using that technology. So I think it's interesting to know now that um, like the distribution of star drums, which became Tama, which was yeah. the, the, the stencil drums where they were copying the, the, you know, the Slingerlands and the Gretches and the, I guess Leedy would be a, a, an inspiration as well, but mm -hmm. where it was distributed from and where did it come from? And then, and, and then you guys were in on that. I mean, so you helped get these because star, I mean, oh my gosh, they're, I love them. I have a set of uh, Apollo drums um, here in my house that because you can get these uh, stencil drums for the made in Japan drums for very affordable, uh, affordably. Mm -hmm. So um, it's cool to know you guys were the ones spreading them around. What were they? Did did Meinl, You probably said this, but did they distribute them just around Europe, or did you help get them over to America? And no, everywhere? we distributed them only in Germany. In Germany, okay. just in Germany. Yes, got it. Hoshino has different distributors in all European countries. Sure. And we, at that time, we were only for Germany. Now we distribute Tama also in some other European countries like Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary. Got it. But that's about it. Yes, it has only been limited to Germany. The symbols that we were making in the sixties, those were lines like. People probably never heard those names. They were called Roman Mark 70 or Roman Mark 74. Mm. Those were the lines we made in the 60s. Those were not professionally sounding symbols. Okay. Uh, those were made for entry and mid-range drummers. Also price-wise, they were priced entry level or mid-range. Up until mid-80s is when we produced all these lines for this price range. There were lines like King Beat or Streamer, Laser, Meteor, all those uh, series. Some people may remember, some not, but those were the symbols at that time. They were not professionally sounding symbols. Hmm. Our focus was at that time was not on the symbol manufacturing because we were working very hard to establishing our wholesale business. Okay. Um, and also in the 70s, we started to make percussion. And then that was another huge focus where a lot of time, most of the time and energy went into creating and establishing our percussion brands. Hmm. And the symbols that were, I wouldn't say left behind, but we mm -hmm. were not putting enough focus on the symbols other than making entry and mid-range symbols. Gotcha. That switched, like in the 80s, we, uh, we decided to put much more focus in producing and developing, first of all, developing professional symbols. And then in the 80s, we 
we bought machinery. We bought our first hydraulic hammering robot. And we had to learn how to operate that machine and how to tell this machine how to hammer a symbol. You know, we had no, we had nobody to teach us, you know, yeah. this technology was almost not existent, at least not in Germany. We, we sure. all had to learn it by ourselves, trial and error. Hmm. And this was in the mid eighties. And the first series that we called like a professional sounding line was a series called Profile. Hmm. Our profile okay. range, maybe some of your listeners will remember that. This was um, made, I think, in 1984. Yes, we launched that line in 1984. And then 1985 came a series called Raker, which I'm sure more people remember. Some people even, they still play the Raker symbols. Some people even. Yeah, I've heard of that. They contact us and they want us to reintroduce Raker line because <laughs> they, they love the line so much. Um, at that time, we also had our first two endorsing artists who played Raker and Profile Symbols. One was a U.S. drummer, American drummer named Bill Berry. He hmm. was the drummer in R.E.M. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was playing Minel exclusively at that time. And the second drummer was... German guy named Stefan Kaufmann, who was playing in Accept, which was a heavy rock band. Yeah. Pretty popular, yeah, pretty. Definitely huge. Huge band from Germany, Stefan Kaufmann. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I've seen that. Uh, um, I've seen the, the, the catalogs and I was trying to do yes. some research. And I think in the 80s is when you actually start to see, like, you know, you guys are appearing and being, being you know, a real, not that you weren't real before, you were being like a, a this is a, uh, professional symbol brand, obviously. Yes. Um, we were taking things more serious at that time because, like I said, our wholesale uh, department within Meinl was established and was working and running and we were making money from it. So we had time to focus on symbols. And same for percussion. I mean, we worked on both simultaneously, on symbols and percussion. We always had different teams to work on symbols and to work on percussion. And so... Simultaneously, we were um, pushing both further up symbols and yeah. percussion. Yes, yeah, that's a it's it's like an age old story of um, uh, drum brands getting into distribution. Like, I mean, back to the twenties yes. and the thirties, that is a very common thing. To even with symbols, you look at old like you'll look at old Gretsch catalogs or these companies, and they have Zinn or I forget some of the other ones. These symbol brands that aren't you know, they're not making, but they just, they're there. They yes. distribute them. And um, we made them, you know, we, there used to be a brand called Camber symbols. Yes. I have some actually, I have some sitting in a pile. <laughs> really? At, wow. Not at one point they were also made by us. Yes. We made, okay. This business is called OAM business. Mm -hmm. And we were heavily into OAM business, making symbols for all kinds of other brands. Just slap not, not another brands. logo on it. Right. Yeah, just stamping any kind of logo, you know, whatever you, you buy, 500 piece and we put any logo on you like that kind of a business it was a good business for us it kept the machines running kept the people the staff busy and at that time it was good business and important business for us but since many many years we have stopped doing oem symbols sure some other milestones maybe when we talk about the 60s yeah like in 1964 we hired our first employee like, remember, the company was started in 1951, and only sure. in 1964, we hired our first employee. His name was Gustav Strobel, and huh. he was working with the company until uh, the late or the early 2000s. Man. In 1965, we were the first symbol maker to pack the symbols into poly bags. Nobody has done that before. Now, what does that mean? I don't, I don't think I know what that, what is a poly bag? A, a plastic bag. Oh, Okay. Like each symbol okay. comes in a plastic bag. Okay. Yeah. Which one. is now like you get your symbol and it's in a little bag and it. Exactly. And we were the first one from all symbol brands to, to do this it was oh, in 1965. Wow. Huh. Also, um, a couple of years later, we were the first company to introduce pre-packs. Like in 1974, we offered the first pre-packs, like pre-configured symbol sets. Yeah. And right. To our knowledge. Hat. To, wow. our, to our knowledge, nobody has done that before us. 
So sure. these were all things we did in the seventies and then eighties we covered already. Yeah. Yeah. And before I forget the, the, it just, it just hits me in my, in my, you know, going back to the Japanese thing about how you guys would, you know, white label it where you would print things, different brands on it. It, it, that is in essence. And you're working at that point with star drums. That is in essence how all of that made in Japan stencil drum stuff worked where there are so many that have different, um, brand names. Like you come across, and it's basically the same thing where they're distributed by, you know, Hoshino. It would be like the uh, star, the world's supreme quality, all that stuff. You can tell where they're from, but it's just that's very common. And it seems like a big thing in uh, in the 60s where you'd 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 get that. So that's uh, that's just funny. The good, good parallel there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it. I think it was a common thing in the music Absolutely. industry worldwide. Sure. Probably yeah. still is. I mean, to some degree, I'm, I'm to sure. To some degree, yes. I mean, when we talk about symbols, there are so many brands now, and there are only a few manufacturers, and they all, all these symbols come from there. There are like Chinese, there are a lot of Chinese manufacturers, and there are a lot of Turkish manufacturers yes. who uh, produce symbols for almost all of those brands nowadays. Yeah. And you just, so while we're, going through the 60s, 70s, 80s. I just want to like, for there's a lot of listeners around the world, but for me as an American guy, I've actually been to Germany. I've been to, I think I was even, I was at a train station in Frankfurt and I don't think I actually went out beyond that because it was just on passing through. But you, I mean, there's just a connotation and I'm sure it's a good one and it's it's well-deserved of everything being very efficient, being very clean, being very well-made. That has to transfer over into the symbol making and the percussion making. So they're competing with like, when you think of symbols, like if you just ask someone, they think of symbols, they probably go, Oh, Turkey. Right. Even though it dates back to China and it goes back very far, but there's symbols made in Turkey. There's symbols made in Italy, obviously like UFIP, there's symbols made in China all over. There's symbols. I mean, Zildjian was made in America, Sabian in Canada. What makes a special what makes german symbols german symbols if that makes sense like i'm sure it's changed over the years but um but was it always like a very efficient clean process like you guys are kind of known for going back to the beginning that's what i would describe it yes okay i would describe it i don't think there is a typical german sound Mm -hmm. of symbols maybe in symphonic symbols but not in jazz rock styles okay um, but I'm, I think there is a German way of engineering and of organizing a factory. And I think we're pretty good at that. We're pretty good yeah. at that. Yes. Yeah. Everything in our, I mean, we have a, we have a factory in Turkey that is very traditional hand labor type mm-hmm. factory, still very modern compared to Turkish style factories, but sure. It's still a very traditional place. Then we have our factory here in Germany that is, yeah, you know, you walk efficient. in there, you walk in there, and you, you almost don't notice that this is a symbol factory. It could also <laughs> be a car factory or computer yeah. factory. That's how everything yeah. is organized and the machinery and how clean everything. At least we try how clean everything is and yeah. the way we organize things. Yes, that's funny. There's, there's, there's uh, worse stereotypes to have than you're very clean and efficient. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. I mean, I take uh, that. We are a uh, how you call it. We're not a cheap labor country. Sure, we're we're sure. manufacturing, or the, the the staff is paid poorly. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like that at all. It's just the opposite. People here they earn good money. Everything here is like as far as like the environmental aspect and everything all of that is on the highest level and all of that is expensive it costs money rightfully though but yes. that also means you have to be very effective and efficient in the product otherwise your product is becoming way too expensive you have to be able to produce it in the most efficient way in order to keep the costs down yeah. in order to be competitive price wise so if you if you have a factory in some third world manufacturing country where none of this is really relevant of course you 
you you can be less effective but still maintain a competitive price point. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. Sure, but you're disregarding people's safety and things exactly. might not be as consistent. All of those, and, all of those standards, yes, that we yeah. obviously have to have here. Okay. Now, is there a, and we'll jump back into the history here, but is there a specific thing? I guess you said there's not like a, a typical characteristic. So they're hammered symbols. It's not like in Italy where they, they spin them. I forget the actual term they use. Or in, um, you know, in Switzerland, they're very, you know, there's a certain sound to it. Is there, is it, is there a specific technique that you guys use, like the minor blah, 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 whatever technique, or is it just a nice, clean, beautiful way to make symbols that's in traditional fashion, you know? I don't think there is anything special in, Got it. in a German way of making symbol. Um, we hammer symbols, not by hand, at least not in Germany, not by hand. Yeah. We uh, There's a robot hammering the symbols, or we press the symbol into shape. Mm -hmm. That are the two things, how you can the two possibilities how you can make a symbol. You can hammer it or you can press it into shape. Sure. And we do both here. And the technology behind it, it is almost always the same. I'm sure there are small differences. Yeah, but of course. The, 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 the basic method is more or less always the same. Okay. Yeah. No matter in which factory you go. Yeah. Okay. But they sound great, and they're obviously every symbol has its own characteristic, and uh, and 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 people love them. And and I think I think part Thank of you. a symbol company is is the 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 endorsers and the it's the marketing, the, yes, the marketing, marketing and the feel. Of course, I mean, there are nuances. You know, there are nuances in how you produce a symbol that make a difference sound wise. Sure, it's tiny little nuances that we do differently than other companies, um, and that makes a difference sound wise you know the the finishing the way you treat the surface the shape of a symbol the bell mm -hmm. is a very crucial part of a symbol all these things they take years and years of development until you reach a point where we are now and of course there are nuances and th things that are different within all the manufacturers it's like unique Absolutely. to each company, unique yeah. to each brand. And that develops over years and years and years, decades even. Yes. Yeah, that's like anything you do. There's going to be some, we'll call it competition, but people, there, there's enough of the, the pie to go around for everyone. And people like different things and people mix and match. And, uh, and it's great. So, um, okay, well then jumping back in here. So I'm on your, your website looking at the history. That's very cool. And I'll, I'll, Share it in the show notes, but just interesting. Looking at 1974, it says Minel starts selling the first, and it's, correct me if I'm jumping ahead or anything, Minel starts selling the first Japanese Tama drums from, from Hoshino. So now we're not doing Star. They've actually changed their brand to Tama. So yeah. that relationship has gone on for, I mean, that's that's got to be a, that's that's pretty neat. I had no idea you guys were so connected to Tama, um, at least in the German kind of like that, that market. That's yes. really cool. Since 63. Yeah, we are That's importing great. them since '63. We were the we were like I said, we were the first customer they had outside of Asia. Hmm. Very cool. Mm -hmm. God, that's such a big part of your business is distributing and yes. other instruments, other brands. Um, which it's just that's just good business there. Had, so there we have had a lot of other brands over the years, not yeah. just Tama and Ibanez. We had all that the Dario brands at one point, Promark. Evans, we we worked with Evans when it wasn't owned by Daddario yet. You know, when Bob Beals uh, founded Evans, we were already doing business with Bob Beals. Mm. We were doing business with the Brostein family for Promark. We've done business with Daddario Strings. Um, a lot of guitar effects. There used to be a company called Oroctron. Mm. I think they were from Texas and. They were like uh, guitar effects, digital di guitar effects. We we bought a lot of their instruments and distributed them. And a lot of Asian, lesser known brands also. Mm. Guitars, yeah. drums, all kinds of stands, huge business. 
like uh, music stands, guitar stands, all that kind of accessory business that we have done since That's the great. 70s, 80s, up until early 2000s. Wow. Yeah. You guys have the uh, distribution channels and the logistics and, again, the efficiency and cleanness down. Yes. So why not uh, do that? We have, so. we have the sales force here, you know, like sales team, traveling reps, in-house sales reps covering many countries in Europe. Yeah. Hmm. That's great. They're all, they're all working for us. They're not jobbers working independently. They all work for Meinl and exclusively for Meinl. Yeah. I've always heard such good things about about you guys, and mainly it's from you know hearing like Mike Johnston and stuff, who I'm sure you guys love because he's such a good ambassador to the brand. He's um, wonderful. But, <laughs> he's so great. <laughs> really gets the word out. I mean, yeah. again, for a guy like me, halfway across the world to be getting information, it's through things exactly like we're doing right now, where it's people like you talking and then word of mouth and 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 good things spread, and just as much bad things spread, where they say, oh. I don't like that. And then someone repeats it and then they repeat it and they repeat it and they repeat it. So it's good to have a, you know, you guys have a great reputation. Um, okay. Thank so yep. m moving forward here, anything else in the seventies, I see you guys 78, uh, minor percussion gets founded, um, and starts production in Thailand. Yes. The percussion factory in Thailand. We started that in 1978. Well, also about the seventies, 1972, Reinhold Meinl, which is the second generation of Meinl family, he joins the company in 1972. And then 1978, we start the percussion factory in uh, mm. Thailand, producing congas, bongos, timbales, chambis, and all these instruments and starting to sell them all around the world yeah, in this late 70s. Yeah, that's huge. That is a huge part of what you guys do. You almost... S yes. You must take for granted about how much you, how many like Cajones, you always see the Minel logo and, yep. and, and djembes and stuff. It's just so cool. Awesome. Well, then moving forward there, I'll let you take it away and, and uh, keep chugging here. Talking about the 80s, like I said, we launched a series called Profile and Raker, which were the first hydraulically hammered cymbal lines that we introduced, which we consider a professional sounding cymbal in the 80s, we had guys like Bill Berry, Stefan Kaufmann as artists. Unfortunately, at that time, we did not have a professional working artist relations department yet. So we were new to all of this. Um, artist relation wise, there was nobody who was comfortable or knowledgeable how to work with those drummers and endorsers at that time. So mm -hmm. this was kept on a, on a minimum. This all happened on a very low level. Until the 90s, like late 80s, early 90s, we had a series, maybe some people know this, called Tritonal. This was the name of the series. And in fact, this was a Billy Cobham signature series. At that time, we had cool. Billy Cobham endorsing minor symbols, and he had his own signature series called Tritonal. Unfortunately, our cooperation with him didn't last for long, only a couple of years until mm -hmm. we uh, separated. And from there on, the 90s were very important for our percussion business. Again, the focus was more on establishing percussion versus symbols. Series like Lightning or the Custom Symbol Shop, which we introduced in 95. Hmm. A That's series cool. which still exists today called Classics was introduced in 1996 and series A Moon, Candela. All of these series were introduced in the 90s. Yeah, that was the 90s seemed like a big changing period in general. Yes. Things go from, you know, like if you really think about it, 70s, it was kind of the end of that, you know, the rock it just things progressed like so yes. quickly like the 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 80s were a big drums you know huge 20 cymbals and then in the 90s you got smaller five piece sets more traditional yes. cymbals and stuff yes. um but mtv and people, mtv you know? yeah so people see dave grohl playing i'm sure yes you know hot rods sales went through the roof and yeah. <laughs> dave All grohl these, yes yeah it was a very progressive decade the 90s yeah, yeah. also for us also for us. 
Sure. Um, yeah. I bet. Um, also, you know, international travel became more easy and more affordable. Um, hmm, the internet was about to come to life in the 90s. So it was a time where you could like foresee some really revolutionary things going to happen. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. And then for us, in the year 2000, two, two really significant things happened. First, we founded Minel USA. Up until that time, we have always worked with distributors in the United States. And in, on January 1st, 2000, we have uh, launched Minel USA, our own company, at that time in Miami, Florida with our own office, our own warehouse, our own staff. So that mm. was a big step towards the American market for us. And it is still the case when you want to be successful globally all over the world, you have to be successful on the American uh, uh, market. Because sure. especially in the music and entertainment industry, the world it's looking towards America. Everything that is happening there is trend setting in music, in movie, yeah. in, in mm -hmm. technology. So uh, we knew that if we want to make it as a global brand, we have to have the success in the United States. And paying tribute to that, we, we launched Mindle USA in the year 2000. Mm. And That's got to be huge. That was huge, yeah. At that time, I was actually... I was moving to Miami. I lived there. I've lived there for six months from October 99 to March 2000 to help launch Minel USA. Wow, it was a nice a, time. I enjoyed it. It's different it than much. Germany. <laughs> very different. The winter in Florida is, I mean, you know, celebrating Christmas on the beach with oh. a Christmas tree is yeah. totally different compared to like three feet of snow in exactly <laughs> yeah completely different there's no um it, it being a guy who lives in you know a city where there's all four seasons it it's sort of weird when you're in a place where there's no snow and it's like oh did was christmas yesterday i don't it didn't yeah. feel like christmas but um so i have a question so i always want to like ask maybe the simple questions that someone who's younger or older or just doesn't know and i think we talk about distribution a lot can you kind of put it, you know, in a nice package? Like, can you explain the distribution process? Because I think people know, it, it, just by nature, we know what it means. But when you say we were using distributors to get into America and then we built Minel USA, then we didn't have to use distributors. How does that work? Like, yes. just the distribution process yes. in theory. Yes. Good point. That's a good Thank point. Thank you. Imagine you're 15 year old and you want to play drums. And you go to a store and you buy a set of drums. So how are the drums going to get to that store mm -hmm. when they're made in Japan? And this is basically what it is. So there is a company, let's talk about a set of drums. There is a company that produces the drums in Asia, somewhere in Asia. Then there is a company in America called a distributor mm -hmm. who is importing the drums from America, from, from Asia. The drums go in a container and they go on a boat and they go on the ocean and then they come to America and then the distributor receives the drums, they put them in the warehouse and then the distributor sells the drums to the music store and that's where everybody can buy the drums from. That Got is it. the distribution process from the manufacturer to the distributor to the music store to the customer. That's okay. basically what it is. And when I say we were using distributors in America, meaning we as a German company, we sold a lot of symbols to one company in the United States, not to each symbols, uh, not to each music store, just to one company, and they are the distributor, and then they sell to all the thousands of music stores in the United States. And that's how the distribution channel works. Now, and does 
do they actually so does the distributor and I don't want to get too technical but does distributor actually they buy the product from drum company or from you guys like they actually purchase it so they take the like risk of then actually selling the product that's right or okay just making sure or not not I didn't know if like hey give us 50 of these we'll sell them and then we'll pay drum company back in China they actually, and I'm sure they buy it at wholesale and then sell it and mark it up to the store. And there's little markups along the way. Yes, that's how it should be. I'm sure there are situations where it's different too, but usually that's how it should be. Yes. And that's right. why you, you can't directly go and buy drums from, you know, from certain companies. You have to go through like, let's say Big Bang Distribution, which is a big one. Um, yes in america um okay that as a music makes, store yes yes exactly as a music I mean, store they are big music stores the bigger the music stores get you know the the higher the chance of them buying direct from a manufacturer also okay so sometimes music stores they act both as a distributor and as a retail store okay there are many many scenarios possible especially in times like now where we have the internet and Amazon and all the online sales and stuff like this. I mean, uh, the distribution channels have changed a lot over the last 15, 20 years. They have changed yeah. a lot. They are not as traditionally manifested anymore as they used to be. Okay. And a little bit more open with global travel yeah. and so on. Yeah, Everything has changed. I mean, yes. now you're... Everything. Even... I'll, I'll interview a lot of like authors who have like books and they always say they always go just get it on amazon <laughs> like it's it's yeah. just easier where instead of going to get it order it from a bookstore do this get it from alfred get it from whoever it's like just that get it from you know that mega uh distributor so yeah the um, product will always find the way to the customer sure that's a good way to put it <laughs> it's yeah. not a quote that i I invented, I have it from somebody, someone told it to me and it's totally right. The product will always find the way to the customer. Yeah. Hopefully if Hopefully. the product is good, the right product. <laughs> yes. The right product. It's all Which, up to the marketing of the brand to make sure to create the demand for the customer to want your product and then how he gets it, the channels, how he gets it. They are very diverse right now, but the product will always find the way to the customer. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So, all right. Then in 2000, you're in Miami, you're drinking pina coladas on the beach on right. Christmas. Exactly. <laughs> and there's no more distribution. So you guys are then the factory that has a warehouse full of symbols, then providing it. You're your own distributor then, correct? Correct. That's right. Yes. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Three so, years later, we moved from Miami to Nashville. And that's where we are still are. Okay. Yeah, that's a big music city. It's music city. It's the center of the nation, of the country. You know, uh, shipping is the shipping center. FedEx, UPS, all these companies are based in Memphis, Nashville area. Mm -hmm. So it makes a lot of sense to be there. Yeah. And it's music city. Another milestone yeah. that happened uh, two years later, 2002, was we founded our Turkish factory in Turkey. Hmm. Um, that was a huge milestone because B20 Bronx alloy is a sound and an alloy that we have not had up until then because it's a very unique way of producing and also being able to manufacture B20 alloy that we uh, were not able to do in Germany. So we have not had the B20 sounding symbol, but that is the sound that everybody wants to hear. Yeah. But in Turkey, that can be done. You know, all our B20 symbols are handmade in our Turkish factory. They're cast from copper and tin, and then they are uh, made into these Bison's range symbols. That, now, that why is it only, ever since, yes. Why is it in Turkey? Like, why can't you do it in Germany? And I've talked with Paul Francis, I've done Andy Zildjian, I've done this, and I should know this, but why can't you do the B20 um, stuff outside of, of Turkey? We, we certainly could. We mm. certainly could. Okay. 
the thing is that Turkey is known for symbol making. They have a huge tradition of symbol making. Everything in terms of symbol making, not everything, but most everything originates in Turkey. Like when you have a car that says it's made in Germany, it is already automatically, it's a great car. Just because yeah. you can say it's made in Germany or exactly. Swiss cheese or <laughs> things like this. And so is a Turkish yes. symbol. You know, a Turkish symbol is automatically a sign of a stamp of, of, of quality and approval. Yeah, definitely. So you have the staff there, you have the you have the history there of traditional symbol makers who know their craft, who know the art of symbol making. And um that's why we went there. But Okay. I mean it was also it was coincidence because we were approached by Turkish people who wanted to cooperate with us in a symbol factory in Turkey, but they wanted to be Meinl, the brand and the name behind that Turkish factory. So it was an idea our Turkish friends had, and then they approached us with that idea, and that's how we started. It was coincidence. Hmm. Perfect. Wow, yeah. good timing there. And It was yeah. good timing, and then it took a year for us to uh, develop the first series, Bison series, and then we launched them at one of the music messes in Frankfurt. Yeah, and from there on, together with our team at Minel USA, everything fell into place. We had we had our own company in the USA, in the most important music market in the world. We had symbols that sounded on a quality level like all other symbols out there, and the sound was... Uh, one that was appreciated and wanted by drummers out there mm -hmm. at that time. So that yeah. was, everything fell into place. And then soon we hired at the already mentioned U.S. Artist Relations representative, Chris Brewer, who uh, immediately started and was able to uh, get in contact and sign those artists for us that were playing minor hmm. in in the early 2000s and then late mid 2000s and then everything fell into place we had the artists we had the product and then the internet happened the internet got stronger and stronger more important worldwide and that for us was a blessing because from very early on, I think we knew how to utilize the internet to communicate our brand to yeah. the drummers. We knew that we had a, it was natural for us to work with the internet and incorporate the artists in our communication the way we did it and the way we still do it. So all of Definitely. it fell into place. And then NAM shows started to happen every year. I mean, we were there in the 70s already, but then like in the 2000s with Minel USA going to NAM show every year, every year, we the sales were picking up, the product got out and yeah, everything uh, started to happen more and more. And then following the USA, also globally, internationally, we became more successful we kept on as like here in Germany, all the development happens in Germany, the R and D. So we kept on developing and increasing the Bison's line of symbols. The Bison's dark, extra dry, vintage, all these lines were developed in the two thousands and the, until two thousand and fifteen hmm. roughly. We started our own minor drum festival in two thousand and five. Yeah. And then year after year, we had one here on our own premises. And during the last one, we had 2,000 people from 25 countries visiting our wow. drum festival. The internet was booming. We were oh, filming yeah. all the performances. So all of this progressed and accelerated. And, you know, you fast forward, fast forward, and then all of a sudden, you're in the year 2020, and here we are. Yes. Yes. I mean, YouTube, 
Instagram, Facebook. It's like when you do a drum festival in 2005 is pretty much, um, I mean, it's, I don't know the exact year, but that's kind of the year that I think of like YouTube is starting to boom and all these things. And, uh, Oh yeah. And it, it's no longer, you're doing a, f- like a drum festival for 2000 people. You're doing a drum festival for 200,000, 2 million people who can watch these over for and the over rest and over of again. the world, you know, for, yeah. yeah, for all of time, for all um, the time. I mean, like, like you said, our first YouTube video was uploaded in 2005 and it was from our first Minor Drum Festival. It was a Thomas Lang performance video that yeah. we filmed. That was our first YouTube video. Quality wise, it is terrible. <laughs> Not Thomas playing, of course, no. but the yeah. production. <laughs> but still, it's still on our YouTube channel. It was the first video that we uploaded there. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I'm sure it's got millions and millions of views. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Everyone loves Thomas. That's funny. Yes. Wow. Man, so, well, that's that's an amazing yeah. history. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing history, you know. And in the meantime, we developed symphonic symbols. We didn't have symphonic symbols. That was another very... Uh, very big and also an important step for us to step into this world, the classical symphonic world. Mm-hmm. This was 2009. One of our all-time favorite best-selling symbols, the sand ride, Benny Grepp's sand yes. ride, was developed with him in 2009. You know, and all of these steps, you know, they make the following steps much, much easier. Everything you do afterwards becomes much easier because you have developed and created a sense of trust within the community. And yeah, it just makes many, many Mm. things easier to, uh, to accomplish. Yeah. And we're, we're not done yet. We're not finished yet. Oh no. I I feel like, not that you guys like you guys are just getting started is the wrong term because you're you've been doing it for what is it 70 years now but um but i do think there's this just like i don't know guys like you said benny greb benny thomas lang mike johnston i mean these guys are it's not luck that you get these great endorsers because the product is great and people believe in it but but there's a bit of like you know, you pick a winning horse where where they're using your product and they become massive and they're huge drummers and everyone sees it and they want to go out and buy it. And again, it goes back to Ringo using Ludwig. It's like, boom, everyone wanted to buy Ludwig. Okay, let's go buy, you know, this brand. It's, it's I mean, it's you guys are there and it's only getting bigger and better. Um, and, and it's very family owned, obviously, from what I can see on your timeline is there's it's 100% family owned. We're now in yeah. the third, third generation of Meinl family. Yes. Hmm. Wow. That's awesome. I love hearing that instead of it being, you know, it's yeah, we're just a company with a, you know, bunch of guys at the top who don't care about it. And it's just a, you know, a board like that who gets together. It's not yeah. like that at all. I mean, hmm. Yeah. It's it's a family business and it it shines through. It comes through in many many things. When when you work here, when you when you when you spend time here, like we have, we have like Reinhold is the second generation. Reinhold's wife, her name is Ingrid Meinl. She also works in the um, in the company here, and a lot of our staff here a lot of workers they they refer to her as mom milo that's you know, awesome it's because she looks after her people for years and years and years so it really is a family vibe that we have here wow there are i mean i'm here since 30 years there are people here since 35 40 actually 50 years people <laughs> are working here wow it's and we see each other every day for at least eight, nine hours a day. So we, yeah, it's, yeah, I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. You're a lucky guy. And y- you, both you and, and I've never met him or talked to him, but Chris Brewer, you guys both have, um, again, it's just funny how people hear these things through mediums like podcasts where you guys have, the two of you have a very good reputation and, um, thank you. And yeah. just, you know, and, and I'd say bad, bad reputations spread just as much as good reputations. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, uh, 
Mm-hmm. You guys have a very clean and good reputation and, mm-hmm. uh, and you're a competitor. That's for sure. You know, when, when I, when I signed Benny for Meinl, he nobody knew who he was. I mean, <laughs> let's say wow. not a lot of people knew who he was. Yeah. But not a lot of people knew who we were either. Yeah. So it's like we grew together. It was a very natural development for him as an artist and for us as a brand. We grew together and we complemented each other. You know, we benefited from him and his increasing popularity in the drumming community. And at the same time, he benefited benefited from us in us developing his sound that inspired him to play a certain way he plays. Benny wouldn't be Benny if he didn't have those sounds available. Yeah. And we wouldn't be Meinl without people like him. And I'm mentioning Benny, but this goes for literally almost every artist that is in the spotlight in our communication. It's the same story with 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 Mike Johnston, with Kelvin Rogers, with uh, Annika, Benny, all these guys, you know, we grow together. And that's a very natural thing and also authentic. And people believe it. It's they it's not a it's not let's you know, maybe you can call it like a fake marketing. It's not like yeah. this is very honest and genuine and natural. At least that's how yeah. we try to to be. Yeah. And I, I'm a big believer in, uh, in anything you do. You can't buy that. You can't do it overnight. It has to be developed over time. It has to be earned. Um, and that's with music. That's with work. That's with, again, I always, I do audio engineering. It's like with audio engineering, you have to do 50 jobs and screw up 10 of them and then do a hundred perfectly and make, have problems and, and to know what you're doing. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. Step by step, small steps, one at a time, but very continuous steps. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Well, um, Norbert, why don't we, I mean, normally we say, why don't we tell people where they can find you? Google Meinl, <laughs> you'll, <laughs> you'll find it. For anyone listening in, you know, and there's people all over. Maybe someone's not as familiar. It's M E I N L, uh, Meinl symbols. Um, obviously, there's Meinl dot d e right or we, we, i guess we could just do meinl.com probably redirects you i would imagine right no <laughs> sorry meinl.com is a coffee maker from austria <laughs> okay that's so don't go to- that has nothing to do with us there's a, a company called julius meinl from austria and they make coffee that has nothing uh, to do with us people find us on meinl.de which is like the corporate page sure that we have it doesn't tell you anything about our products if you want to know about symbols, you go to minelsymbols.com or minelpercussion.com. This is how you can find us. Obviously, we are on all social media platforms available, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Anybody can find us there. And then I always mention this. There is this one email address that everybody can very easily remember. And this email address is info at minelsymbols.com. And that goes straight into my inbox, and I personally respond to each email that mm. is going to come through on this email address, info at minelsymbols.com. Man, that's great. And I, I can, I've can i learned from the show growing in popularity, and I, I absolutely love talking with everyone and getting emails, but it is very time-consuming. So I think that's a, um, uh, that's a great thing where you're taking the time to, to actually, like, you know, talk with people and answer questions and do all that and give your email out. Um, so good, yeah, good stuff. I think it's very important, you know, absolutely. If I have, if I, if I want to know something from another industry, another brand that I'm a fan of, and I send my request, I expect an answer in a timely manner. And that's what they get from us. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you, I don't get that a lot from uh, some people I reach out to or I say, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll blame it on COVID, but it's like, let's do a company history. And no, then I don't ever hear don't back. Don't blame so. it on COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's COVID and I'm answering No, no, it's, it's, too, it's too easy to blame everything on COVID. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Yeah, don't blame it on COVID. Okay. No. Oh, great. Well, um, that's awesome. This has been amazing. I've learned so much. Um, I feel like I fully know the company now. And really, uh, that's great. I just, I love 
again, hearing more about the Jap, the, the made in Japan stuff. I just, again, building these histories of other little subcategories, like on a lot of episodes, I'll learn, um, about what was going on during the wars and what was happening then and in England and this. And so it's, it's really cool to piece this all together. Um, yeah. so great Norbert. Well, thank you so much for being on the show and my uh, pleasure. I, thank you for having me. Sure. My, my pleasure. And I encourage everyone to go out and, uh, buy some minor symbols and percussion and not the coffee. That's not them. <laughs> it's good <laughs> coffee too. <laughs> I bet. I'm sure. It's good coffee too. Cool. Uh, just keep playing music, no matter what kind of music, just keep playing music. Yes. That's keep important. playing music. Yeah. All right. Thanks Norbert. You're welcome. Thank you. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at drum history and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.